Should work, hopefully. There we go. That was great. Okay, so yes, so uh, welcome uh, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, Green Safe uh, Network workshop, and thanks for your time today. Um, so I'm Harriet, as um, I've probably met quite a few of you. So I'm the Green and Safe um, Engagement Officer. Uh, and I work for Natural Resources Wales and um, closely with Newport City Council as well to deliver this uh, green and safe intervention, um, a one Newport Public Services Board wellbeing plan. Uh, and overall, it's a lot, a lot of, you know, about partnership working and uh, connecting people to green space and nature and championing everything, you know, the multiple benefits that getting out in nature brings. Um, so, yeah, today keen for you all to um, obviously interact with each other and network as much as possible. Um, and if you can pop your name uh, and roll in the chat bar, especially new people, um, might be a bit easier to do that rather than go around everybody. Um, uh, yeah, and just introduce yourself, perhaps when you open up your, your mic and speak. Um, uh, and yeah, feel free to ask obviously any any questions today. Use the raise raise your hand. Uh, and um, yeah, if you're happy to put your camera on, that's great. But if not, don't don't worry, no pressure. Um, so yeah, the session today will hopefully be sort of more collaborative than, than, than the last one. Um, you know, and that's what it's all about, partnership and collaborative working to, to work towards our shared goals for green and safe spaces in Newport. Uh, so I encourage you all to use, yeah, as I say, use, ask questions in the Q&A sections, um, use the chat function throughout um, uh, and use the raise your hand function as well. Um, but perhaps best to, um, pop your mic on mute just for the presentations if that's okay um but other than that um yeah encourage you all to get stuck in ask questions and give comments throughout um and it looks like again there's a, a good mixture of people here today uh again same as last time which is good to see um so i'm just going to talk you through the agenda just quickly so our first presentation is from uh, Laura Cotton. I'm going to talk about the Stevenson Street flood scheme. And uh, the second is from John Stone from Main DN Limited. I'll talk about um, a lot of their projects going on. And the third presentation will be from Laura George from Coyd Hill. Uh, talks about um, their, their projects and the potential projects in Newport. Uh, and then we'll have some breakout sessions just to look at the new vision and steps and how, how, the how of how we're going to sort of deliver those things. And hopefully, the, you know, there might be a space to sort of share your project updates as well. Uh, and then we'll have a bit of a feedback after the um, breakout sessions and then um, just maybe talk about what we'd like to see at the at the next workshop. Um, so, yes, without um, any further sort of, uh, uh, question, comments about that. Um, we'll just uh, crack on with the presentation if that's okay. So I'll just, um, like I say, the first presentation is from Laura Cotton. Um, it's going to talk about the Stevenson Street flood alleviation scheme and the enha enhancements to Coronation Park. Um, and I'll now hand over to Laura. Uh, stop sharing my screen. And um, yeah, I'll hand over to you now, Laura. That's okay. Thank you. <coughs> Fingers crossed now. For the yeah. <laughs> Can you see my slides? Yes, I can. Can everyone else see that? Yeah, it looks good to me. But you can't see my notes, which is what happened the other day. You just see the slide, Harriet. Yeah. We're all slide, good yeah. then. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This has taken some doing on my part. So yeah, um, as Harriet said, I'm Laura Cotton from Natural Resources Wales. Um, my job title is Lead Specialist Advisor in Environmental Assessment. And um, part of my role is to help um, some of NRW's major kind of capital schemes and um, get consent and embed enhancements to them. So obviously this scheme is in Newport and um, so I welcome the opportunity to speak today about it. I'm going to give you an introduction to it, why we need the flood scheme, a little bit about the flood scheme but more about the wider vision, how it's linking to green and safe and um, the project aims and objectives, the work around Coronation Park and the landscaping. Um, the consultation that we're currently undertaking and um, an estimated programme. So I'm going to experiment with a laser pointer. So um, this is where we are for the scheme. It's in, um, you see, kind of well, lower central Newport, 
the transporter bridge here, grade one listed building, and then Coronation Park and green space there. We've got an existing flood fund running along the red line with the Wales Coast Path on top of it. And then we've also got quite a complicated area in terms of industry, um, you know, quite big um, kind of undertakings there. The Orb Steel Works up here, Liberty Steel, um, and the power station further south, the sewage treatment works um, and the Corporation Road Industrial Estate. And there's a sand wharf here, which is um, a material asset in the in the local plan. So rather than a map, here's a photograph of taken from the top of the transporter bridge. So it only shows part of the scheme, but it's the, the kind of the, the Coronation Park um, element of it, um, which is used a lot for, for football. Um, and then obviously a lot of people use the, the coast path for walking. Um, this is the Newport City Dogs Home, if you don't know the area. And they have a fenced dog exercise area um, that they, they can use. And then between the flood bund, um, the river itself is protected, but all of this area between the flood um, bund and the river and the river itself is is also protected um, nationally and kind of internationally um, is a site of special scientific interest and special area of conservation. So we've got quite a lot of working constraints um, to the scheme, the environmental designations, as well as all of the industry and all the utilities is a big factor. Note this very large pylon. So um, much of the, um, the Sputty area and Liswery Ward um, is at risk of tidal flooding, which is obviously why we're doing the scheme. And the, the speed and the depth, because it's tidal, of this flooding is, is really hazardous. It could extend at speed two and a half kilometres from the embankment. And, and the light blue area shows you know, the, the area of Newport that is currently at risk without the scheme. So the flood scheme will protect homes and regionally significant um, industrial areas, the A48, the Sports Village, um, Newport Stadium, Dragon Park, as well as many other, like you know, important um, community and health assets such as um, schools and, um, and, and medical centres. So, the the cost benefit ratio for the for the flood scheme, which we need to be able to prove to submit a business case or a successful business case, is um, is really high. It's a priority project this for for the Welsh government and and the council and for and for NRW protecting up to 2,000 homes. Uh, there's a couple of photographs here of the um, a near miss uh, last year in a, uh, a high tide event. And on the left, uh, a photograph of what the flood bund and the Wales Coast Path currently looks like. So the bund is in poor condition. Um, the coast path on top of it has become you know, quite narrow. Um, it's got a estimated life um, for its flood defence purposes of less than 20 years and could overtop in um, a kind of one in 30 year event and we're designing the scheme to be uh, given protection of one in 200 year event. So in terms of, of the project um, this is who's delivering it as I said Natural Resources Wales are kind of are, are leading they also have other roles as consultees um, and, and stakeholders. The funding um, subject to successful final business case. We've got outline business case approval already is from the Welsh Government. Our designers throughout have been Arup and then obviously the council have been heavily involved too, um, including some of the people on the call today in um, parks and um, public rights away, highways, ecology um, and drainage to, to name a few. So a little bit about the design of the scheme. Um, it will provide a mix of ground raising, sheet piles, um, and new earth bunds as well as some concrete walls. So up in this area, which is not currently um, accessible to the public, in the Orb Steel Works, there's some minor ground raising. Then around the transporter bridge, there's some minor work um, around the, the kind of the landing area for the transporter bridge. But the main main section of the scheme starts here. So starting in the north, the blue line here raising and widening the existing flood bund back in towards Coronation Park slightly. And then the purple line, the sheet pile wall will raise, um, a, you know, provide a new um, flood defence along this purple section to the conveyor belt. And then the scheme moves inland and there's a mixture of concrete walls 
um, a new highway because an alternative means of escaping a flood is required. Um, and there's also a need for a flood gate at um, Corporation um, right out of the, the business part there. It's been quite a complicated design and it's taken quite a few years to develop. But we're here to talk about green and safe. So in addition to reducing flood risk, the key project's objectives did include um, improving the experience of the coast path users and links to the adjacent green space, um, integrating sustainable management of natural resources principles, fulfilling some of NRW's wellbeing objectives and bringing benefits to health and recreation, as well as biodiversity and water framework directive improvements. So we, we had a vision for the area, although it is quite well used at the moment, to, but to become more of a, a destination in its own right. Um, and as such, we um, appointed Arup to develop a landscape master plan to fulfill this, these objectives and um, focusing around that green space around the Coronation Park and the Wales Coast Path. And I thought it'd be interesting to show you how that um, landscape master plan developed. If you want to see it's in full, it's included in the landscape, um, sorry, not landscape, the design and access statement for the, for the scheme. And um, our landscape architects were Wan and Ali from from Arab. So, what else? so first of all, we started looking back um, you know, to make an analysis of the site, of the site, looking back at time, um, long history of human settlement around the area, what it's looked like, and then what is there now. We did an analysis of the site, and we mapped this. And I've already mentioned some of the, the key things that we've got there in the Wales Coast Pass, Sustrans routes. Um, but also some of the infrastructure that causes um, constraints to the design um, and opportunities and, and the transporter bridge. It's a real iconic asset um, to the city, views from far and wide. So from this, and I apologise, it's a little bit fuzzy, but constraints and opportunities were developed. And we did go through quite um, at a workshop just over a year ago, you know, quite um, some options that have since been refined. Um, and the, the principles of those have remained the same, but we have had to scale some things back. But, um, you know, the, the transporter bridge and the industrial setting has kind of inspired the design um, some of the, the materials. So we developed um, precedents and, and moods and, and boards. And then from that, started to look at like what kind of materials we wanted to use. The, um, the transporter bridge again was important in trying to, to match that geometry that you see across the landscape and, and the materials of that. So this is what the landscape master plan looks like now in summary. And um, at the bottom, we call this the hidden wall. People aren't really going to be walking through this area. They're going to be walking on this section of the coast path, which we are going to widen and resurface as part of the scheme. So we're not doing um, a great deal of work in there, although there is some drainage improvements through swales and planted um, vegetated basins. This section, the trail, there'll be the new um, sheep pile wall. I've got a visualisation of that um, and we'll improve the coast path. But the main focus has been around Coronation Park, which we're calling um, the loop. And this is what the loop looks like. Um, and it's we call the loop because we're proposing some new pathways um, through Coronation Park here. So you can do a fully accessible walk through that loop um, and improve connectivity between the park and the transporter bridge um, and help better define the use of space within Coronation Park. There'll also be um, accessibility and inclusivity improvements to the coast path on top of the Bund um, and regular resting areas um, providing views um, across the Usk and towards the transporter bridge and a viewing area here um, stepping down to, to marsh level. Also proposing to improve the um, public realm space at, in front of the transporter bridge gondola area and entrances to the park. And then at the bottom here, um, there's tiny urban forests proposed, which is dense tree planting with seating around the edges, which you'd be able to sit on to, to watch the football matches or just the quiet contemplation. And um, there's uh, opportunity for these to become a, a centenary tree beacon for World War One Memorial and um, that link was made since the the last um, green and safe workshop actually the, a presentation that was made on on those. So here is a visualization um, it's not exactly as proposed but we also put um, 
you know, this this area of viewing is included, but this is not in the in the final design. But it gives you an impression of what this widened um, bund will look like with the, the Wales Coast Path, with viewing areas to the back and and the front, and and quite a lot more tree planting. And then this is um, yeah, the the sheep piled section. We did need to carefully consider the height of that wall because we we did want to avoid railings on the top of it. Um, we wanted the path to be as wide as possible as well. Um, and obviously it has to do its job as a as a flood defence. So we're undertaking a um, consultation at the moment on the on the scheme. So um, you hopefully received an email from Harriet notifying you of this. So the if you put into Google Stevenson Street flood scheme citizen space, that's the mechanism that we're using because we can't have a town hall kind of event at the moment. And in there, there's um, an opportunity for um you know to well there's the email address for the scheme but within that consultation page there is um you know you can do a questionnaire and you can give feedback and i'd like to thank the people that have already commented i know there's a few from this group um and you can uh, yeah you can raise questions through there so the um scheme delivery as estimated at the moment, we're just finishing the pre-app consultation, which will close on the 21st of um, April, if you want to get any comments in before then. And then following that, we will address comments and submit a uh, planning application in um, in June 2020. Uh, and then there'll be a final confirmation of funding for the business case and construction in um, uh, would start late, late this year, um, if that's all in place. Um, Right, I'm just aware that I didn't miss something. Um, so I'm just going to go back to this slide and link a little bit more to the, the green and safe um, objectives. So we considered antisocial behaviour in the design um, and, and, the, and the materials. We've improved access for fire and rescue with a new ramp onto the marsh and also for litter picking. We've provided um, we're going to provide bins, which the councillor uh, have kindly offered to, you know, maintain and empty to help prevent um, some of that litter and um, dog fouling. The long-term maintenance agreements we're working on in collaboration with um, the council at the moment. Um, but finally, you know, not forgetting that the flood risk benefit and that feeling of safety for, yeah, thousands of people. So I think that this scheme does link well to green and safer objectives, and especially kind of the the improvements to the coast path um it will you know there'll be wildflower planting on the buns it should be you know a, a really nice setting for people to go to i think that does bring me to a close um look at this picture that luke provided us some time ago and um really like this from the opening of the coastal path so hopefully we'll have an opening like this when we um do the scheme but perhaps with some more um more social distancing than the than the shown there um so yeah that brings me to a close uh are you take you want to take questions um do questions now harriet or, or towards the uh, end yeah thank, thanks for that uh laura yeah is there any anyone got any questions uh now um might have a minute or two if not um obviously feel, feel uh, free i do if, 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 oh, go on. sorry yeah Mm -hmm. A really quick one, uh, Martin Corley, Gwent Police. Uh, it was only that that park has traditionally had some issues with uh, unlawful encampments. Has any consideration been given to uh, target hardening that? Because it would be a shame for that area to yeah. be kind of uh, uh, damaged in that way. Yeah, I know um, Jenny Judd, I think, might be on the call, has raised that with us, the parks manager, and there there will be restrictions at, at the entrances. Um, we're just kind of finalising the designs of, of what that will be. But they'll also um, at the entrance um, nearest the transporter bridge, there is already a set of gates there as well, quite big gates. So, um, you know, that does give us the opportunity to restrict access to vehicles at that point, but still make it easier for people to access at the um, kind of the pedestrian entrance. But yeah, you're right. There are the, there is a need for um, for consideration of that as well as um, potential uh, misuse of the park by um, motorcycles um, I know is a concern of um, you know some of the councillors and, and some of the council staff as well. Thank you. That's, that's great thanks. Um, Kathy's just asking what sort of trees will be planted? Uh, well it's a mix um, currently you know there's a schedule in the um, in the documents 
I don't know them all off the top of my head, but I'm currently going through that with our landscape architects. So there's, um, you know, it's going to be a, a mix of, you know, probably mainly native native species, but some that will introduce this colour in the autumn for, um, especially in that uh, urban forest area for the for the tree beacon, because the idea is that they kind of show their red and orange and yellow colours in in the full glory in in the autumn. But I'm happy to to sh who was it that asked? Oh, sorry, I um, Kathy it. Barkley from Gwent Wildlife Trust. Um, if you want Kathy, I can then send you the um, the tree schedule. Yeah, no, I was just hoping that it was natives. I'm, I'm sure it, I'm, I knew it would be natives, um, predominantly natives. There are native trees that have nice colours as well. Um, yes. The more natives we can get, the better. I think that message knew it really needs to come through strongly and especially I mean also I wonder if it's an opportunity to involve young people in planting and the schemes and things like that so that I'd, I'd be yeah, quite interested be in being great. involved in the wildflower meadow creation and the tree planting as well would be great if we could be I was going to um, actually say yeah. but there's so much I wanted to try and fit in in 10 minutes yeah. if any of the groups do have any of that links to communities there then we'd be really interested in trying to explore that because I don't think we've really done that yet, perhaps because the project's taken so long to develop. We, you know, it's been years to design, really. And um, you don't want to be going to telling the community too soon. We're, obviously, we're starting, you know, now we're getting nearer. And in terms of the tree planting and getting children involved and, and things, we are really keen. So I'll um, make a note of your. Um, yeah. yeah, and I, I'd also be quite interested in doing a before survey. And you know a wildlife survey before and then maybe in a year's time or two years time and see you know with the young people to just to try mm. and explore how it's changing what you know what we've done you know if there's any ways that you could steer it in a different way you know, that's yeah yeah okay sounds interesting Sorry. obviously we have extensively surveyed it um yes yeah um, i know but yeah for the baseline data but um, yeah. probably not a, a kind of product that would be suitable for children uh, no I imagine so up to the age of 24 so it could be people who are you know trained surveyors so oh, okay we I, I just want to put it out there anyway <laughs> yeah thanks Kathy. fab there are three more questions but if it's okay we'll just move on to um john's uh from Indian limited and, and we'll come back to those questions just at the end just 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 for time if that's okay but we will come back to them um so Yes, thanks. Thanks, Laura. Um, so if I can now um, hand over to um, our next presentation, uh, it's John Stone from Mainz Limited. It's going to tell us a bit more about uh, a few of the projects they have underway. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to sort of share your screen now, John. Yes, yeah, sure. I'll just do that. Thanks, Harriet. Um, one second. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Yeah. Fabulous. OK. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. My name is John Stone. I'm from Mendium Limited. Um, I don't think my my presentation is going to be as slick as Laura's, but um, well, here goes. We'll give it we'll give it my best shot. OK, so I'm a trustee of Mendium Limited. Um, I'm also the project coordinator for Green in Mendy. Um, Green Mendy is a sort of sub project that we launched probably about sort of 18 months ago, two years ago. Um, and we're turning our attention to the to the neighbourhood itself. The focus prior to that has been very much about the library, our refurbishing of the, the library as a hub, which I'll talk about shortly. So we're looking to um, we're looking at the neighbourhood and we're looking at all the ways we can do to sort of enhance and restore the green spaces that we do have in, in Mandy. Um, this isn't my full time job. I'm, um, I'm by trade. I'm sort of uh, an ecological contracting specialist and consultant. Also, my background is in sort of fisheries management and aquaculture. But I've got involved with Mainly Unlimited and this is the work I'm going to talk about today is something that I do on a voluntary basis, as indeed do my other colleagues as well. So trying to fit all our work in, in and amongst our day jobs is, you know, can be quite challenging. Um, just moving on. Okay, I'll just put this slide up. It just gives you an indication of um, the aerial shot of Mainty. As you can see, it's um, it's highly urbanised, highly sorry, highly urbanised conurbation. 
Um, as you can see from the screen, there's very, in li very um, little in the way of uh, green spaces or indeed blue spaces um, within the neighbourhood. There's lots of houses of multiple occupation um, and a lot of people don't have access to gardens. And one of the biggest issues for us is the lack of green, um, green spaces and play spaces for people. Um, so in terms of our focus, we have to make use of the best that we've got. So look at the existing space, look at the, the, the green corridors, look at the fragments of land and try and sort of build almost like a patchwork um, and improve those spaces. So people have got something on the doorstep that they can sort of retreat to and find sort of quieter, quieter spots to, to go to, which is quite important given the times that we've just been, that we are going through at the moment. Um, this, this graphic gives you an indication. One of the issues we've got in Mindy is air pollution. Um, the the colour marks in dark brown there. That's um, the arterial routes that go through um, through Mindy itself. Um, there's high nitrous oxide levels. Um, it's, it's a real issue uh, for for local residents. So. Obviously, the environmental conditions are not great, and we have to look at finding ways to try and mitigate that. One of those is I would very much like to increase the tree cover within Mendy. It used to have a lot more street trees, and if you walk around, you'll just you'll see that a lot of the tree pits um, are now empty. So, um, in terms of future vision, we'd like to get those resurrected and get new street trees put in, because um, it has so little tree cover canopy. I think it's one of the least in uh, in Newport actually. This would go some way to, you know, improving air quality and certainly flood risk. So after that sort of bit of a gloomy assessment, it's it isn't all that bad. It is a fantastic neighbourhood. It really is. It's um, very multicultural, very diverse, and energetic place to be. And even though we have few sort of green spaces, urban wildlife does thrive. It has a phenomenal sparrow population. There are lots of hedgehog sightings throughout Mindy. Um, and as I said earlier, there's there's lots of fragments that if we can sort of link up, we can sort of create wildlife corridors and just create spaces at every turn that when residents are walking through, passing through the neighbourhood, they can get a bit of a lift as well. So instead of being presented with fly tipping and littering and all that type of thing, they're presented with something that's attractive, it's beautiful. And it can make a bit of a difference to their to their daily lives, you know. So that's the vision. That's our focus, really. Um, I don't expect to sort of read this. It's not very clear. But this is back in 2016. Um, my colleagues before I joined, my colleagues at Radio Unlimited commissioned um, a draft master plan. Uh, they call Green Fingers, looking at all the potential areas that could benefit from environmental improvements. And since I've joined and we've launched Green in Mendy, sort of my role really is, is to sort of pick up the baton and look at these areas and see where we can improve. Our trouble is we have very limited resources, so we can only do what's available to us in terms of um, volunteer effort, um, money, that type of thing. But actually, we're working through them. We've made really good progress and, uh, and I'll tell you a bit more about those as we progress. Okay, um, so just a little bit about Main Unlimited. So for those of you who may know, we're based on Chepstow Road at the library. The group you can see in the photograph, thanks to them um, back in 2014, they saved, essentially saved the library from closure. And in that time, there's been a major refurbishment. The library has become a really successful community hub, um, offering all sorts of courses, uh, sorry, um, workshop space and uh, and basically the platform for organisations to me, it's it's a really thriving sort of community hub now. And from from this point, we've managed to turn our attentions to the to now to the wider environment of Main D. OK, so this is a project we're really excited about. Um, funny enough, work is starting here as of this week. Um, this is a project that's been probably five years in the planning. It's a lot of blood, sweat and tears from the trustees and the volunteers to get us to this point. 
So this is a former toilet block site on Chepstow Road, right opposite actually the library. Um, it's a site that's been abandoned for perhaps five years. Um, you was belong used to be on by Newport City Council um, and has been closed uh, for quite a number of years now. Mindy Unlimited has acquired the lease for the site, a 99 year lease. And we, our intention is to create a uh, cafe and community space for the residents of Mindy. We think that this project will be great for kickstarting a sort of a, a cycle of regeneration in the neighborhood. Um, and also be good for the local, not only the local residents, but the traders as well. So this is the design. Um, we're really lucky to get a firm of a really good firm of architects who are based in London and Berlin called KHVT. They've come up with a really great concept. There's lots of different elements to the cafe. Um, we've got sort of a performance area and a climbing wall, uh, seating area, um, outdoor sort of raised beds for growing herbs and, um, and produce, play areas. We're going to have a, um, a covered awning, which would be great for creating a COVID friendly sort of environment for, for people to socialize out, outdoors. Um, so, and the other thing we've got, which we've been really thankful for was um, funding from Natural Resources Wales and Newport Public Services Board for a rainwater harvesting harvesting system and also green roof bike stores for the for the site. So we're very excited about that also. Um, so as I say, work's now ongoing. The, the scheme will launch hopefully in August um, and then we'll be followed by a programme of events after that. So yeah, just really case of watch this space. Um, if you're driving past, please uh, go and have a little wander and see um, see how uh, things are getting on. This is St Mary's site on Warfold and Corporation Road. As you can see in the image, there was not much there. It was a real dumping ground for um, for fly tippers, sofas constantly being left there, mattresses, and God knows what. Um, we acquired the site through um, St Mary's Church. They gave us permission to create a garden there in, in that space. And this is um, it's approximately about 18 months old now. And as you can see, we've um, achieved quite a bit in the garden at that time. It's matured quite well, actually. So we've got lots of areas. We've got raised beds, lawn areas, alpine gardens, uh, herb gardens, uh, perennial planting areas, wildlife garden. So we've got many themes to it. Um, it's also a very sort of accessible space, got disabled access, but it just goes to show what you can achieve in a very sort of urbanised spot, really. Um, so yeah, we're pleased about how that's progressing. And again, here are a few more images of the garden itself. Um, it's been used quite well by local groups and residents alike also. Um, so yeah, we're, we, we just constantly maintain this site. Um, and it's just another, so this this one, sorry, this um, particular scheme sort of kick-started the Green and Mandy project, if you will. And now we're turning our attention to all the other spaces we have in and around Mandy. Again, this is another project we're very excited about and it's happening at, at this moment in time, um, which is Eveswell Community Centre. You may or may not know of this site. Um, it's opposite the fire station in Eveswell. Unfortunately, the site is gradually declining. Fewer and fewer uh, visitors and groups are using the space, but it's a fantastic space. It's really accessible. It's got great facilities. And we approached the council about sort of taking on the space and creating a community garden here. You can see from the images there, we've been busy creating sort of um, raised beds. They're now done. We're just waiting for the soil and other things to arrive. So very shortly, we'll have a um, community allotment space for people of Mainly and and, uh, and Eveswell, which they could utilise. We've uh, recently planted uh, an orchard there as well, and we've got various ornamental planting beds. So we want to make this a really thriving sort of space where we could perhaps run short horticultural courses and um, environmental training schemes and that type of thing. So we definitely see this as a work in progress and um, are very excited about this. Now this is um, an interesting space. This, this is on Corporation Road. Um, weirdly, this little plot, nothing has ever, um, there's been no development on this plot since the streets were built, which is a bit of, I can't understand why, I don't know what the reason is behind that. But again, this is another sort of dumping ground for litter and fly tipping. Now, 
what we'd like to do here is create a little pocket park. Um, we think that this will brighten up the street scene no end. Um, we've got a lot of support from the local residents also. Um, on the right of the screen, that's a flyer that we circulated to, um, to the residents. And uh, so now you know, we've been very fortunate, again, thanks to Harriet and the uh, Public Services Board, we've been given a small amount of funding to purchase materials. And this, the next coming uh, sort of coming months, we're looking to create the pocket park and get the, as I say, get the locals on board. So again, watch this space. This is just about to come to fruition. This scheme just off Corporation Road, further down, more closer towards Newport. Um, this corridor sort of links, um, takes you to mainly primary school, but also um, Rodney Parade football ground. Now, this is the wall that you're greeted with as you enter the walkway. Um, now, we looked at this and thought, wouldn't it be great if we could have a sort of full-size mural on there? So we approached um, a professional artist, Andy O'Rourke, and he's been looking at this wall apparently for years and he's really keen to take this on. So we've now just managed to secure the funding for uh, the project. We've um, consulted with Newport City Council and we're going to create a sort of nature themed and community themed uh, mural, which will be semi abstract. And we think it'll be an amazing addition to the streetscape here. Um, this is also quite close by. This is like a linear corridor that links uh, the Riverside with Main D. It's just by the bus depot. It's a very long, very wide space that's really underutilized. So what we've done here, what we did here about 18 months ago, we planted a community orchard and it was doing very well. We were really thrilled to bits with it. But unfortunately we had all our trees stolen. And that is the only thing we've ever, that's ever been stolen while we've been doing our work in Main D. So that was a bit um, a bit upsetting, but not to be deterred. We planted again this winter um, with trees that have been supplied by Keepwell Tidy. So we hope to sort of continue our work in this space, create community allotments, additional sort of uh, um, soft fruit bushes, wildfire meadows and that type of thing. We believe that this corridor could be great for improving connectivity for wildlife and for, for biodiversity. So this is very much a, a work in progress. So I mentioned about the mural. Well, this is a bit further down uh, the walkway. Um, just the, the images at the top. This is, you can see on the left there, very overgrown um, space. Again, prone to fly tipping and, and litter. And we thought, well, okay, we could create a garden here, but it's gonna be very difficult to water. It's a garden that needs to be sort of left on its own. So what we decided to create almost like a, a dry Mediterranean garden. Um, and so we set about doing that. We have planted with sort of grasses and dry up tolerant species. And it's been really good. None of the plants have been sort of harmed or damaged. We've had a lot of support from local residents and it's going really well. Um, we've also further down the corridor, um, we've um, had a couple of the kits from uh, places for nature which we've included so you know that's been a nice addition also longer term we'd like to submit um, a, a bigger funding um, a funding submission to uh, places for nature because we would like to do a proper sort of full ecological enhancement of that corridor so again it'd be a watch your space really um, food for life this is a project my colleague Angela is running now she launched this um, we recruited Angela back in January last year and it was going great guns until obviously coronavirus hit so what Angela's had to do is um, switch her attention to providing sort of online uh, sort of workshops cookery classes and that type of thing and that's been very successful but unfortunately it's nothing like the real thing so now that we're sort of coming out of lockdown we're hoping to resume um, our activities and I think there are plenty more events sort of planned for the remaining six months of the project uh, and the idea behind this project is really to try and sort of create opportunities for people to come together learn how to cook share food meet like-minded people that type of thing so again yeah that's another exciting project that's um, that's on the go so just to summarize um, yeah it's um, it's interesting 
you know, Main Deep with all its constraints and it doesn't have any sort of charismatic parks and we don't have places that are beautiful or attractive. However, we can turn spaces around and really make a difference. And if we aggregate those spaces, they can become something, you know, it can really make a difference to the look and feel of, of the neighbourhood. And we're starting to feel that already. Um, the feedback we are getting has been fantastic. One of the problems we have is, is volunteers and COVID's made it really difficult to sort of, for people wanting to sort of come out and, and, and of course we're restricted about, about, we can only meet in very, very small groups. So we're hoping to bring that back online again, but people in Maine, they've got really busy lives, just existing is, is a challenge. So trying to find time and energy and inclination to come in and, and, and do this sort of work. It's very difficult for people um, and we understand that, you know, but we have a core of volunteers and, and we're accomplishing a lot with, um, you know, with the limited resources we've got. But it would almost justify, we we now realise that um, with the projects that we've engaged with, we could employ a full time sort of green spaces and engagement officer. And long term, that's what we're looking to. You know, it is really a case of, you know, out of this, we should be looking for funding opportunities to and um, employment opportunities for people within uh, the, the locality. I think that would be a really good legacy from Green in Mainly. And we're going to push hard to put a business case forward for that. So, um, yeah, and finally, you know, we couldn't have done our work without the support of Harriet and everyone at Natural Resources World, and also particularly Newport City Council and the various teams. They've been phenomenal, really, in helping us deliver our projects. They've been really good. I can't sort of overestimate that, how um, accommodating they've been. So I'd just like to say thanks for those. But more importantly as well, our volunteers, they've been great. And, um, you know, we were all offering off sort of free time and, uh, you know, we're making inroads, we've made good progress. So that sort of wraps up me for today. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, right. John. John. Oh, a bit echoey there. Um, there's a couple of things in the chat bar, um, just about um, some funding opportunities um, from FEN, which I'll circulate around to the group as well. Um, uh, Joe or Joseph Lewis has just talked about the links with the, um, the you know, and it, it's a great initiative and that there's a lot of parallel links with the Welsh Government's recently published Race Equality Action Plan, which I think we can chat a little bit about um, at the end of the workshop, actually, those um, themes along that, along those lines. Um, Chloe's just popped uh, a, um, a link in the chat as well about uh, litter picking um, bright vibes, so I can also circulate that. And, and Catherine has mentioned the level living levels bright spots competition in terms of uh, uh there's some funding possibly for uh, that would link with Halstead uh, pocket park um so yeah we're running over time a little bit but i'll just um uh Bern, bernadette bernie's got a question um just wondering if there are any plans for the corner plot um so a, a fountain used is that right Bernie, sorry, if I can come to you. Yeah, the the the, the part where um, it's by the bus stop, the main bus stop yes. in Mendy, by Hot Rocks, that strikes me as just a little bit of a, a disappointment. Is there is there anything planned for that? I was just wondering. Sorry, which bit is this? I'm just to familiarise myself with it. Right. You know where Hot Rocks is? No. Um, it, the team has already planted it up, actually. It's full of tulips at the moment. Oh, is it? Uh, yeah. That, that shows not of... when I've been into Mainzy recently. Yes, it, it, it's looking very nice right now. But, I mean, you're right, Bernie, a lot of the time it doesn't. Um, but the team have put spring bulbs in, and so it's looking good at the moment. But it is a place that could do with a bit of. Um, so I'm I'm just trying to get my head around which bit this is. I'm I'm not sure what Hot Rocks is. So it's, we it's, may have something planned. It it's closed now, John. So you might not notice it. Oh, so right. It's actually opposite Weatherspoons as well. It's that bit where. Um, yes, we we have got that earmarked. You know, temporary because 
we totally agree. It's a real site. It's a real mess. Um, and we thought, OK, what can we do just initially? So we planted with uh, spring bulbs as a first instance, but we that is on our radar, certainly, because it's a very visible um, sort of site within the, within the main high street. So and also the fascia, it's got that horrible 60s concrete sort of look. It, it is pretty grim. So, yeah, it is it is something we were, we're aware of and we will be coming across that, you know, in time. Yeah, I also mentioned about recruitment of volunteers. Don't forget that Gavel can help with that. Yes, Don't yeah. That's do that. Just give us a shout. Fantastic. Well, you know, for for me, um, all my work is sort of sucked into delivering the projects and organising the projects. We just don't have the resources to or the engagement bit, which is equally as important, you know. So, but that, yeah, that's great. Thank you for the for, for reminder for that. Wow, that's that's great. All um, lots of people saying, you know, amazing all the work that you've you know you've achieved already. Um, and and Marietta and Kathy and uh, Joanne etc. from Joe Joe from Pobble would like to sort of link with you. So I don't know if you can pop your um, email in the chat, John. And if anyone's got any Absolutely, other questions sure. for John pop them in the chat and maybe John you can answer the questions and and, and, and Alison um you know in in the chat bar if that's okay so we'll, yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll, great thank you um so we'll just move on to the next presentation and it's um from uh, Laura George from Coyd Hill or Smallwoods um and I'll hand over to you thank you Laura thanks Harriet um, yeah, so I think what I'll do is I'll just crack on. I'm, I'm really enthused now after seeing the last two presentations. It's all very exciting. So um, I'll just share my screen now. And apologies to some of um, my colleagues and partners in the call who have definitely seen this presentation or something very similar before. But my name is Laura George and I'm from Coy Clayol, which is the Small Woods Association in Wales. And we are predominantly involved in social forestry in um, various areas of Wales. So I'll crack right on. Our vision as an organisation is for sustainable woodlands that provide multiple benefits to their owners, the environment and wider society. Our mission is therefore to support and promote sustainable multi-purpose woodlands for the well-being of people and wildlife and woodland skills, crafts and management practices that improve the quality of life and enhance the benefits provided by our small woodlands. So it's very much about um, improving outcomes for people in the communities and also taking care of those screen spaces and, you know, making sure that they're around in the long term. Well managed spaces. So there are three main themes to what we do, and um, most of our activities are centred around woodland skills, nutrition and physical activity. And again, it's about making sure there's that link between the people and places and improving the outcomes for both um, through our work. So this is just a quick slide. I won't go through all of the projects, but it's just to give you an idea really of where we operate throughout Wales currently and the various different things we've got going on. And pretty much all of these projects are delivered in partnership with other organisations. So one of the things that we are very keen to do is always to work in partnership with others, um, you know, just to improve access, break down barriers, but also to, to uplift the sector in general to make sure that this agenda is um, integrated into everybody's agenda. So if you look down there at number seven, that's that's me, South East Wales Development Phase. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, what we do as part of this development project later on. But yeah, as you can see, it's part of a whole raft of projects and activities taking place all around Wales. Now, I'll always include this slide because it's just really lovely to see some of the activities out in practice. I mean, obviously, these things have been impacted by COVID-19. But as you can see, there's just such a wide range there. So if you look at the top left, that's our walking groups moving around to things like green woodworking, tree planting. And the one in the top um, right, I think, is just perfect for us as an organisation because it just shows, you know, people having fun. And that's very much part of our ethos. It's all about sort of um, it's certainly impacting on well-being and health, but also creating that positive link between people and the green spaces around them and promoting that sense of stewardship for the green spaces around them. Yeah, and then, you know, things like mindfulness activities out in the woods, nature, art, coppicing, these kind of things. 
This is a slide that contains um, a list of all of the different things that we've delivered around Wales and all of the different type of activities that we do. Now, it's not to say that we can deliver all of these activities everywhere, as things very much depend on, you know, the um, expertise and the sort of focus of our activity leaders that we employ to, to deliver our schemes. And I don't expect you to read through all of these, but it's just to show you really just how um, how big our scope is and in terms of what we can do. And the idea for us is always to tailor what we're delivering for the particular community and partners that we're working with. And so this is basically um, a menu, if you like, of things that we can deliver depending on what is most appropriate uh, for that particular area and what would have the greatest impact in those areas and also help some of the health partners and community groups in the areas where we're delivering to achieve their aspirations as well. So one of the ways that people come to us is through social prescribing. Now, people can self-refer, um, but we also encourage especially health partners and community groups to refer people to us if it's appropriate. And we will use um, any and all methods really that are suitable for that community and our partners. So we've tried postcards in North Wales. So these postcards can be placed in places like doctors, surgeries, um, community halls, sort of anywhere really where people gather to um, to address some of their health and wellbeing needs or, you know, anywhere really where community groups are operating and people might be able to benefit from being involved with us. And the idea behind the postcards is, is you just pop your, your name and your contact details on there, you send it to us and um, we can pick up the referral from there, give you a call and see if you wanted to be involved in something. And I wanted to talk about this one because digital exclusion is something that's come up quite a lot throughout COVID and the impact of digital exclusion during this time. And so I think it is really important to have these um, older, you know, traditional paper methods of referral as, alongside the website. Now we have fantastic um, staff of project officers and mentors and their contact details are all on our website and you know our partners will always have our contact details and things like that so sometimes it can be as simple as a phone call if you feel somebody could benefit from being involved with us or you yourselves would like to be involved with something we're doing you can just pick up the phone give us a call and we will take it from there and then you know just going through some of these other referral methods things like emails posters in the surgeries um, and in pharmacies we have got a sort of set referral form which you can see an example of there on the slide um but i think the point of this uh, slide really is just to demonstrate that we're not set on any particular formal referral pathway if somebody would benefit from green prescribing then we are more than happy to have the conversation um, about how we can we can help basically improve the outcomes for either the group or the um, individual participant that you would like to be involved with us. Um, a large part of what we do is research, monitoring and evaluating. So we have a fantastic um, monitoring and evaluation officer called Natasha. And Natasha has really um, given us that framework to be able to, you know, engage with funders and to make sure that we can make the most of our funding and speak the same language as some of our health partners, which I think is really vitally important. So through Natasha's work, we now sort of use things like the Warwick Edinburgh um, mon wellbeing monitoring forms and things like that, which again really helps us, opens up the door for us to be able to work in partnership with people because this is a pretty standardised way of doing things. And um, it means that when we are working with people whose sectors are slightly different or partners who have slightly different strategic visions to us, that we have that common language and we're able to, you know, um, put in things like joint funding applications and also support some of our smaller partners um, to come on on board with these kind of monitoring and evaluation processes, which again uplift them in terms of their capability for applying for funding and working in some sort of um, different strategic ways, I guess. And then just ever so quickly, we also um, encourage sort of anybody who's studying or researching academically social forestry to be involved with us and we will 
help students, certainly in my short time with Coitley all so far, we've had several sort of academic involvements with um, PhD students, people in the University of South Wales who are developing a social prescribing monitoring system. And I think that that's really important for us as well to make sure that when we're having those conversations with people who are doing the development work, but also because social and green prescribing is such, um, well, I don't want to say it's a new new thing on the agenda, because I think the people who've been working in the sector would agree that it's actually been on the agenda for a long time. But we're certainly seeing it gain some traction now. And I think it's important for organisations like Coit Leol, but also some of your organisations to be speaking to the people who are doing the academic work and inform um, inform their papers, you know, to make sure that these uh, monitoring systems that come out of it are, are suited for us and for um, everybody who's working in social forestry. So this is an example of our um, online nature sessions. So due to COVID, we brought quite a lot of our sessions online. So prior to COVID, our main activity was something called Active Woods which was very much delivering these um, sessions that we spoke about in the beginning, the things like the willow weaving, the green woodwork, the coppicing, was delivering those in the woods with small groups. But obviously due to COVID, we couldn't continue to do that. So we've brought a lot of the activities online. And there have been pros and cons, you know, again, there's the digital, digital exclusion problem. But also we've seen a lot of people who perhaps would have been a little bit nervous to um, engage with us prior to that. It's been a really nice way to introduce them to us and our work and some of the benefits to nature connectedness. So again, you guys are all more than welcome to come and join these sessions or um, signpost people to these sessions because they are an awful lot of fun. And I mean, certainly myself, I've learned so much just by attending these sessions. So a vision of the future from Coit Leo's point of view would be a nature based healthcare embedded within the health system. We've been consulting a little bit with um, health partners throughout this project. And one of the things that they're telling us that comes up quite a lot is that they find people presenting at um, clinical settings are quite often there with social problems. And I think that one of the things that work like ours and um, certainly some of the projects we've seen through um, previous presentations here, they can help alleviate that that sort of stress um, by addressing some of the social problems. And obviously the long term vision there is to stop people with social problems presenting at these clinical settings. Um, and again, talking about that social prescriber agenda being developed and fully functioning with a variety of options for outdoor woodland activities. And I think what we're addressing is it's not just about us. There's so many people doing fantastic work and we really want to be um, involved in embedding that kind of idea that people would be prescribing outdoor activities and, you know, getting people out into any kind of green or blue spaces that would benefit their mental and physical well-being. Um, we'd like to see the development of woodland sites to improve green infrastructure and improve access. Um, and I'm hoping you can see how some of these um, or some of our strategic visions really link back to the, uh, excuse me, put my teeth back in, links back to the green and safe spaces agenda as well. So we're also looking at training pathways to um, help colleagues who already work in the outdoor activity sector, but also to help colleagues who aspire to include these activities in their day-to-day um, -day running of things. So we want to offer this training out to people and we're in the process of developing some really good Agorid courses and we're a Agorid assessment centre so that we can help with things like walk leader training, um, we do best practice workshops, various different things that perhaps people who are a little bit removed from being able to deliver outdoor activities can engage with that will really increase their capacity to deliver these things as well. We would like to secure more funding through health boards. Um, we are starting to see now acknowledgement from the health sector uh, that the impact of, of our kind of work really is great. And so we'd like to secure more sort of partnership applications with health boards just an acknowledgement really that the evidence base for our, the impact of this work is growing. And I think that's something that we're slowly chipping away at. 
Um, and then finally, and perhaps most importantly, it's about community engagement. Um, so long term community engagement that provides preventative and therapeutic care to communities, whilst also caring for the woodland and environment. So a little bit about our approach in the Gwent area. Um, we're looking at what, what we call a needs and opportunities approach. So first of all, we will look at some of the data sets um, like the Welsh Index of Multiple Deprivations to identify areas that really do um, you know, suffer from multiple inequalities, especially in health and employment and these kind of areas. And then we will sort of try and target our approach as close as we can or make sure at least the people who live in these areas are able to access our schemes. We then do a lot of consultation with community and health partners. And this is just a little sort of infogram to give you an idea of the scope of our um, consultation. And just really, I would encourage any of you who would like to be involved in the consultation and who would like to inform our delivery plans to just get in touch. And we can, we well, we would really welcome that kind of um, involvement with yourselves. And via this consultation, we can identify the opportunities as well, what community groups are working in the areas that we sort of highlighted in the last schemes, uh, last a slide, beg your pardon, and how can we link in with them and their strategic visions. And then finally, all this information sort of gets mapped um, out. So we will identify the, the nearest green space. We'll identify some of the needs and the barriers that need to be overcome in access in this green space. We look for referral partners and community groups around that green space who can inform um, what we should be doing there, but who also can bring the participants on board. Um, and we try and compile all of that information in a meaningful way so that we can make sure that the sessions that we deliver there really are, you know, just, just as effective as possible. So this, this scoping phase is ongoing at the moment, and these are all the different strands that I spoke about um, in the previous slides. And ultimately what will happen now is they'll all inform a report and delivery plan, which we'll have in about six weeks. And then hopefully we'll use that report and delivery plan to put in some joint funding applications with various partners and just secure basically all of the different things, the different elements that we need to have in place that will enable us then to actually deliver the things that we have identified as being able to benefit those communities. So that's about all from me. I'm going to pop my email in the chat. Um, I'm more than happy to answer questions now, but I know that Harriet mentioned we're a bit tight on time. So Harriet, if you prefer, um, I'm more than happy to take any questions via email if that's more helpful. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, that would be um, great if that's OK. If you can pop your um, email in the chat. Um, you know, and if anyone's got any other questions, pop in the chat, you know, if there's time and you can sort of answer them there as well or yeah, by email. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. So, um, yes, thank you to all our sort of three present presenters today. Really, really um, lots, lots going on. That's 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 great to see. Um, so just before the breakout sessions, I just wanted to share um a little bit of information before we go into those um so i'll just share my screen a second Let's see if this works now back to that picture okay so just um uh, a little bit about um the uh, new visions and steps they they were created um you know in light of um, COVID and they were sort of due for re review. So the, the Green and Safe Spaces intervention has, you know, these these objectives. Um, so we've, we reviewed them. Uh, we held a workshop in January uh, with Green and Safe board members and a range of other partners were there as well. Um, and it was just to approve, um, it was, sorry, it was approved by the Public Services Board in March, um, just last month. So this now I I feel gives a sort of clearer steer on what we're we're expected um, to sort of deliver and and what we're trying to achieve. Um, so, yeah, I hope much of it, and I'm sure much of it also, um, you know, sort of is within your you know aspects of it are within your roles and your organisation's priorities as well. Um, so, I just wanted to mention the wider context that we use to sort of do this review. So there's quite a lot there, you see, to try and kind of um, 
you know, use some of the sort of language from these other um, various sort of um, reports, etc., that, that are out there. But um, but I wanted to emphasise that the the new visions and steps and actions, etc., were informed heavily and influenced heavily by the network offer document that I've emailed out, and this was created sort of two years ago by the network. Um, but yeah, just to say that the, the links are, are certainly there. Um, just to give a couple of examples. So this is the new step one. So for example, the sort of fourth point down, engage with businesses to retrofit green infrastructure. Uh, and then within the the network offer document, it talks about um, you know developing a tool. Uh, it's the sort of uh, third from bottom there, developing a tool or approach. Um, for green infrastructure retrofitting. So it is lots of crossover. Um, and, and the second one is about safety and access. Uh, and again, um, you know, it's about identifying sort of further barriers, um, which is in the second column here at the bottom. And then in the offer document, um, you know, it mentions exploring community barriers and skills gaps, etc. you know, with using green space. So there's crossover there as well. And then in the third new step that we have here, um, it talks about supporting and developing green volunteering opportunities, which is the one from bottom there. And again, uh, in the offer document, it talked about maximising opportunities for volunteering, which is the sort of middle middle one here. So just wanted to sort of emphasise the sort of crossover. Um, and you know, in the breakout sessions, you'll go into this in more detail um, in one of each of these these steps with um with a facilitator from my lovely team in nrw so there'll be a facilitator in each group and um you know if you sort of feel that we still need the offer document this this one you can see on the screen here um you know from the discussions today i can i can up update that um but yeah in in my view i think the new, the new vision and steps are kind of high level maybe strategy and then the, the network offer is more like a kind of charter that we all have sort of signed up to in a way. Um, but I think the, the most important thing is that we have, you know, the easiest and simplest sort of approach on on the how, how we can deliver these sort of shared goals of ours. Um, and I'm confident there's a lot going on uh, across the network um, already. And it could be then about how, OK, how do we sort of collate that work and sort of bring it, to, sorry, bring it together and sort of measure that um in sort of performance reports that I have to kind of you know that I need to sort of send back uh, and you know how we sort of measure our progress really um so just quickly um some of the updates that might help your um discussions we're looking at a green infrastructure assessment so we're looking at all these sort of green infrastructure across across Newport so that's kind of in its beginnings at the minute uh we have created a green infrastructure map as well, which I can demo at the next workshop, I believe. And we've also done it in terms of safety. So ASB data overlapping with green space as well, which again, we could hopefully share at the next next workshop. Um, just that there's conversations starting up again about Bellevue Park, the old allotment site, um, but that's in its sort of beginning stages at the minute. Um, and there's uh, some sort of rainwater gardens and enhancements of green space along the riverfront. That's in motion as well. And we've made connections with Welsh Water. So again, initial conversations, um, but about um, some sustainable drainage solutions. So that's just to let you know about those. Um, so now I'm going to just stop sharing the screen and I'll stop the recording as well before we go into the breakout sessions. Stop.